Hello, I'm Bob Challoner, the President and CEO of Southampton Hospital, and I'd like to welcome you to another edition of Focus on Southampton Hospital, your monthly television program about the events, happenings, and programs at your community hospital. And today I'd like to welcome, I still think of him as a relatively new member of our medical staff, but he's been here a while, Dr. Gaylord Hoffert, who is our director of our kidney dialysis program and also a, uh, the head of our nephrology program here at the hospital. So welcome, Dr. Hoffert. And, um, Nephrology is one of those specialties sometimes people will say, what is nephrology? And I'm going to ask you about that in a second. But first of all, I know a very, very well-trained physician. You joined us, I think, around seven, eight years ago. 2008, yeah. 2008. 2008. Yep. Okay, great. And just tell me a little bit about yourself, how you ended up out here in South, your training and how you ended up here at Southampton Hospital. Okay. I went to medical school in Germany at the Westphalian Willems University in Münster which is also my hometown. After I finished my training there, I spent two years uh, in a research facility at the Northport VA Medical Center. Oh, During okay. that time, I did my American boards, started my residency program at Brookdale Hospital, and then I moved further east to Stony Brook, where I did my fellowship training in nephrology. Okay. And then after working with uh, one or two groups, I got, got the great opportunity of uh, joining uh, this hospital in the beautiful Hamptons, and um, to become the medical director of the uh, dialysis center in Hampton Bays. Oh, right. And ever since, I'm directing the dialysis center, I'm working out of Meeting House Lane uh, medical practice as a kidney guy or Kid nephrologist. Okay. Right. And uh, I'm also uh, seeing patients on consultant basis in the hospital. Okay, great. And you've been... Um made the transition from Germany over here. How was that as a doctor to suddenly come over here? Did you know English already when you were? I studied English in school. Okay. During medical school, it kind of um, you know faded out. Right. Initially, it wasn't easy. I had to get used to the accent and right. find my way around. And the holiday in America is really the holiday holiday, whereas in British English, we know it's vacation. So it was very vac confusing when I asked patients or, or people, when was your last holiday, where did you go? You it was Christmas, Christmas. Right? I stayed at home. <laughs> right, exactly. So I said, no, I meant a vacation, yeah. did you travel anywhere? So it took me a while to catch up with catch that. Well, you don't quite sound like a Long Islander yet, but you're getting there. I can hear it. <laughs> I'm working on the cup of coffee in the office. <laughs> very good. Very good. You're almost there. Well, speaking of coffee in the office, uh, we're going to talk about nephrology. And the kidneys are kind of the organ processing that coffee for us. So tell us yes. just quickly, um, what is nephrology, the specialty of nephrology? Well, the nephrology is the teaching or the pathology and uh, physiology of kidneys and kidney disease. And uh, the kidneys obviously are the organ to produce urine and uh, the kidneys besides the liver are, and are very important organs to eliminate waste products and to keep close control of our, our electrolytes, particularly potassium, sodium, salt. Uh, magnesium, calcium, uh, those are the most important minerals in our body. Um, okay. Plus they also play a role for blood pressure control and they help to maintain the acidity very tightly controlled so our blood doesn't get too acidic which could lead to other organ failures as well. So really, I mean, a very crucial organ for maintaining many different parts of our, you know, certainly the, uh, the, the blood and the, the quality of the blood and also pressure and uh, hemio almost, yeah, hemostasis? Almost homeostasis, homeostasis, yes, homeostasis, homeostasis exactly, yeah. Exactly, right. Yeah. Regulation of the, the pressure in the yeah. system. And I know that there's <coughs> been some major, major advances in, uh, in the treatment of kidney diseases over the years. Um, and certainly one of them is uh, dialysis. We'll be talking that a, a little bit. But before dialysis, kidney disease was often fatal. Is that, that correct? Yes. Yeah. It was basically, um, quote unquote, a death certificate uh, in the past. And uh, only as of the early 1920s, I would say, they slowly developed dialysis-like abilities. And the first successful treatment um, was 1943 um, developed by a Dutch doctor um, who successfully treated one of the uh, war victims who was in severe kidney failure with uh, hemodialysis. Wow. 
the original concept of dialysis was developed in 1854 where the original concept of separating two different fluids, a clean fluid, separating with a membrane from the contaminated or intoxicated fluid and just to allow the toxins pass the membrane barrier into the clean fluid, fluid kind of aiming for a, a balance okay. between concentrations and therefore reducing the amount of toxins in the um, contaminated fluid. And that was in 1854 and only 60 years later, in the early 1900 basically, um, they started further developing the, the dialysis-able membranes. So um, I'm surprised actually that it's been around as long as it has. I always think of it as something as relatively, I guess, a long evolution to get there at, at this point. Well, if, if we go back to the beginnings right. of medicine with Hippocrates to today, it is a very short time and yeah. it was a great accomplishment. And uh, nowadays, I would say over the last 20, 30 years, it is really more the technology behind it, the optimizing machines, taking advantage of the computer technology, creating a better environment to monitor the patient closer and get better long-term dialysis results. And people are living pretty long uh, lives now with on dialysis, right? Yes, uh, yes. Yeah. Um, most times patients really pass away due to other medical comorbidities. Okay. It is not the typical reason to, to die un, due to kidney failure unless you refuse to uh, get dialysis, to be dialyzed basically. And the alternative to dialysis obviously is also transplantation. Okay, and so um, typically people suffering with kidney failure would have other illnesses often. There may be some other issue even triggering it. What would be what are some of the reasons why kidneys fail? The number one cause for kidney failure, or the number one killer for our kidneys, is diabetes mellitus, which has been a worldwide rampant disease right. and uh, is also contributing to a huge cost factor. The second one on the list uh, is hypertension, high blood pressure, okay. which kind of is going hand in hand with uh, diabetes. Most diabetics also developed high blood pressure. And then, just to keep it simple, I like to um, sum it up as anything which can affect your blood vessels okay. will at some point also very likely affect your kidneys. The kidneys are a very blood vessel rich organ right. and the blood vessels which contribute to the kidney function um, are numerous and are an important factor. So issues like um, diseases of the vascular system can, can also end up ultimately with kidney problems as well. Yes, so. atherosclerosis, smoking, inactivity, obesity, um, certain medications. Or if you have already beginning kidney disease and you reach for the classic over-the-counter painkillers, right. we call them NSAIDs. Okay. Um, they can contribute to an acceleration of your normal age-related kidney function decline. Okay. Do we all experience uh, kidney function decline with age? Is that something that's typical? Some more, some less. Okay. It really depends on your lifestyle, on your diet, um, and on under, under other underlying medical comorbidities. But it is an age-related change is happening, yes. Okay. And is the um, uh, failure of the kidney, uh, how, would, how would someone know that their kidneys are starting, starting to fail? Unfortunately, if you don't get your blood tests uh, done regularly by your primary care doctor and once in a while you want to check your urine for potential uh, proteins, it takes a while before you really would develop symptoms. And I literally saw patients who presented to the office or came to the hospital after 90% of their kidney function was gone. Really? And only at that time um, those patients developed the first symptoms like okay. fatigue, appetite change, uh, change of memory, loss of memory, sleep changes, changes in urination. All of a sudden the frequency can go up. Uh, some patients urinate more at night or some patients experience a decrease in their urination. Really? 
Um, yeah, I would think it would be less if the kidneys are, uh, are failing, but not necessarily. It can be the transition time, okay. actually, that the kidneys um, initially l lose their ability to concentrate the urine. Right. And by the way, that's actually a miraculous organ, in, in my opinion. Um, they concentrate 50 gallon of fluid after 24 hours, throughout 24 hours, to a residual gallons? of one and a half liters. Really? Two quarts maximum per day. Really? So, and that's for two fist sized big organs, yeah. that's an unbelievable task. These are uh, very task. active little organs. Well, I've heard, yes. you, I've heard you call the kidneys your favorite organ. Now well, I know they are why. smart, they are yeah. strong, they are yeah. efficient, and yeah. they control the whole body yeah. to a certain degree. And most diseases, involve the kidneys and wow. unfortunately once the kidneys are getting involved your morbidity and mortality rate in the hospital setting increases significantly especially in the ICU setting. If you start to experience kidney failure and the doctor catches it early enough is there a way to slow down the progression of it or is it almost inevitable that you're going to end up with complete kidney failure? Again, it depends on the circumstances that the kidneys are failing. Okay. Um, if it's a usual age-related change, there's not much we can do, but we always try to work preventive. Okay. And uh, that's a big task I'm trying to apply with my patients. There's the medications we give, which we don't have to cure um, the kidney problems yet. Right. It's not like you give an antibiotic and you treat the infection, so we have a medication we can give to treat the kidney failure. Okay. We really have to optimize the milieu or the environment the kidneys are functioning in, right. meaning we have to make sure they have good blood pressure, they have enough uh, fluid to work with, the electrolytes are overall okay. We avoid certain medications, we optimize diabetes control. And, and I emphasize to patients that, uh, again, a healthy lifestyle, healthy diet, rich in fruit, vegetables, um, and increased water intake is important. And then I get the question, well, how much water is good enough? Right. I drink plenty of water. And, you know, I said, well, the minimum is really 64 ounces per day. What? 64 ounces a day, well, that's the older recommendation. Right. The newer recommendation is really half of your body weight in ounces. And then they nearly fall off the chair. I have to, you know, right, resuscitate right. them. Exactly. And, uh, they feel like they're drinking a swimming pool. Every yes, day, right? exactly. And that's what it feels right. like. But, but some studies have shown that an appropriate fluid intake is, okay. is really helpful. And the purpose of all that fluid intake is to just flush the system, basically? Or what's happening? Yes, it, okay. it helps to facilitate the functioning of the kidney. Okay. If you eat a, a big steak, for example, uh, the proteins are digested and some of the end products, uric acid, the BUN or BUN, the mm -hmm. urea nitrogen waste, and creatinine, which is the, the lab value we also use to measure our kidney function, are significantly increased. Okay. And um, we are not able to pee dust. It's okay. not the best example, but it right. makes it clear. Right. We have to put everything we want to eliminate into solution. Right. And the more dilute something is you want to put in solution, the easier it is to flush it through any system. I see. And it's the same when you're in your household. It's easier to flush some, uh, something through your drain if it's very watered down, very dilute. Right. Whereas when the concentration of the solutes is very dense, right. It might get stuck, you have to help, you have to push it down. Okay. So what I recommend to my patients is really start your day off in the morning with at least 20 ounces of room temperature water. Which would be two and a half glasses of water? Yeah, basically. approximately, yeah. Okay. yeah. One and a half, it depends one on the half. size of the glass, okay. yes. All but right. you're right, okay. absolutely. Okay. And with the, with the reason that all night your body has been working, right. has been metabolizing, building, rebuilding, and we produce waste. Right. And it will be helpful to just keep everything dilute and flush the toxins out. And okay. a lot of my patients came back who tried this that they actually needed less coffee, which can sometimes accelerate the water diuresis through your kidneys, right. and they felt as refreshed and they had a better day throughout the day. By drinking, starting off with a couple starting of Starting off the of day. Water. And then it becomes easy. You right. do this in the morning, another 20 ounces maybe with lunch. Right. Basically, when you eat, you should drink. Okay. That's not what my grandma told me, right. but uh, we have to change our thinking nowadays. Okay. 
What about um, what about <laughs> coffee? Are there any feelings about coffee? I, I love coffee, and I always feel like I'm getting my water by drinking coffee. But it sounds like maybe that's not the case. So. Yeah, by now I'm on my fourth cup, right. as you can tell. So uh, <laughs> exactly right. <laughs> not really. I mean, coffee has a beneficial side effects right. uh, for diabetes prevention. Um, it is claimed that if you drink six cups of coffee a day, which I wouldn't recommend right. unless you're you had a good heart doctor on your side, right. uh, can help to prevent. Um, diabetes, which might be good for your kidneys, right. but it has also a water driving effect. Okay. And if you drink a lot of coffee, you might dehydrate yourself. Okay. And if your kidneys sense that your body might get dehydrated, at some point they might reduce their own blood flow. Right. And for young people like us, it's not as much of an issue, but if you're of advanced age, and your blood vessels are stiffer, right. um, we're not able to adjust as well, and we are at higher risk of damaging our kidneys. Okay. Hopefully only temporarily, which can be recuperated, or permanently, which is more of a problem, obviously. So in moderation, but don't count on the coffee to be the thing to flush your system out. Yes. And what about uh, sugary drinks? Sodas, juices, those sort of, what's your take on that, and do they affect the kidneys as well? Um, well, Sodas are not really recommended right. um, just for all the negative side effects right. uh, they have on your body. Do they directly at this moment damage your kidneys? Probably not right. as much unless you uh, use the diet uh, sodas, which we don't know what side effects right. the sugar supplements have. Um, but the contribution to the development of high blood pressure, diabetes mellitus, right. obesity, comes indirectly back to the kidney. So right. I would rather stick with homemade, fresh or freshly made uh, vegetables and fruit juices. Okay. And you know, there are vegetables out there which are actually beneficial to your kidneys. They help to uh, hydrate the kidneys and increase the cleansing abilities of your kidneys. Oh, Cucumbers, celery, really? um, and, and others. Because they're watery vegetables or there's something in them that's <coughs> helpful? They are watery, but also because they seem to have some uh, phytochemicals okay. which have a beneficial effect. And that is something which we learn more and more that Hippocrates actually was very right when he said, let food be thy medicine right. and I think it's important to follow this idea more because if we look back most medications we use nowadays are originated from originally originated in nature right. like digitalis even aspirin right. and they have very potent side effects right. and now everything is chemical and I think if you have a healthy plant-rich diet, right. and if you're active, you run, you exercise, um, instead of the TV remote, you, you, you use your barbells and yep. you know, you cycle your neighborhood, you go in the swimming pool, you do definitely good for your kidneys. Okay. Just no doubt about it. Sounds like, I mean, the, the advice that doctors give, and it, I, the more we talk to more doctors, the more we understand why it really yes. does make a difference. Smoking affect the kidneys or no? Yes, okay. yes. Not only the kidneys, but also the urinary bladder. Okay. Uh, it can lead to bladder cancer. But again, smoking leads to vasoconstriction. It leads to uh, a production of radical oxygen species, okay. basically radicals. Okay. And any radical exposure, smoking, environmental toxins, too much sunlight, right. stress, uh, leads to a damage of your blood vessels, right. and therefore to atherosclerosis, which damages your kidneys yes. as well, okay. besides the heart, the brain, your eyes, uh, and can also lead to an increased risk for obesity. Okay. Let's talk a little bit, let's switch gears a little and talk about dialysis. Um, um, at what point does, well, first of all, let's Tell me just how dialysis works, the real practical, um, you know, it's a, it's a filter it sounds like, how does it work, and then we'll talk about what a patient mm -hmm. actually goes through when they're being dialyzed. So what we basically have to do is we have to find a means to draw blood out of the patient's body, run it through a specialized filter, and then give it right back in a cleansed form to the patient's body. And we classically do this originally with a catheter in your chest. Okay. Or if we have time to prepare, um, a specialist surgeon will connect two blood vessels normally in your arm underneath the skin and make two blood vessels one big blood vessel. Okay. 
Now, within a few weeks, sometimes months, this blood vessel gets strong and thick. And then we just need two needles through one, we take the blood out, run it through the machine, and through the other one, we give the blood back. Okay. Now, the advantage for this is the only time there's a connection between the outside world and your patient or the patient's body, basically, is during dialysis. After you're done with dialysis, you take the needles out, the bleeding is stopped, there's no connection, no risk for infection. Okay. Whereas when you have the catheter sitting in your chest, it's constantly there. There's constantly the risk for uh, and bacterial infection. It's a perfect entry portal for any pathogens. Right. And we restrict the patients and have to advise our patients that they are not supposed to swim, they're not supposed to take bath, they cannot take uh, normal showers okay. because any water exposure to the catheter site increases the pathogen exposure exponentially. Could get into that wound. Yeah. So, so why wouldn't you just do the, the shunt in the arm for everyone? We are pushing for it and yeah. we really try to encourage our patients yeah. and some patients are fearful of the operation, okay. of, of the pain and uh, to the pain I have to say we have creams and lotions. We apply one hour before the beginning of dialysis okay. um, to alleviate the discomfort. And in the end, it's just like when you have your blood drawn. Right. And over time, within a few months, sometimes a year or so, you get desensitized to the um, pain sensation of the needle in being inserted. In, in the arm. So, um, at what point does a patient need to go on dialysis? That's a very good question. Um, you know, that is entirely dependent on the clinical picture the patient presents with. Mm -hmm. We teach our residents, you know, if the patient has high potassium and it's difficult to control. If the patient is volume overloaded and the classic water pills, diuretics don't work any, enough or not anymore, those are the indications where we go. But they ask me, well, what is the number? The patient has a BN of 100, the creatinine is 5. Let's dialyze him. You have right. to come in now in the middle of the night or during the day. Come in and dialyze the patient. I said, whoa, whoa, wait a minute. Let's see the patient first. Let's see how the patient feels. Now, if the patient has developed over the years slowly progressive kidney failure, they can manage fairly well and they get used to the toxic environment. Mm -hmm. So if that is an older patient, I don't want to have to put the catheter in. I would like to try if the patient is clinically stable, it's not somnolent, it's not lethargic, has a normal appetite, is still functioning to a certain degree normal. Right. I want to take the time to place the AV fistula for the dialysis access. And then two or three months later, I will probably initiate dialysis. Okay. Um, Again, if this is an acute event where the patient is dehydrated, maybe he was bleeding, he took certain medications and he's in severe kidney failure, the patient will be very sick and that's when we come in and would emergently dialyze the patient. Sometimes a patient um, is dialyzed emergently. Can they be dialyzed like just once or twice and that's it? Their kidney function will re or is typically once they've been dialyzed, they're going to need to continue to be dialyzed. That's also a very good question. Yeah. Um, we have patients dialyzed who were taking an overdose of lithium by accident or intentionally. Right. And then we dialyze emergently uh, just to get the toxin out of the body and then allow the kidney to function better to catch up. Mm -hmm. Sometimes we have patients coming in with a severe infection, they were dehydrated and they develop something called ATN, acute tubular necrosis, which is another fancy term that the kidneys are so far damaged that imminently or within a short period of time they will not recuperate. Okay. We start dialysis uh, sometimes three to four times on a daily, like in consecutively, and then they are on a regular schedule three times a week. And we had a few patients when they were on dialysis after three to four months, they noticed number one, that their urination increased mm. and that the creatinine, again, this is the uh, lab parameter we use to calculate and measure the kidney function, didn't increase as much anymore between the dialysis treatments, right. which is an indication the kidneys are functioning better and they're able to eliminate all the toxins, right. the creatinine. 
and we had a few patients where then we said, you know what, let's try it for a week without dialysis. We keep a close eye on your numbers. And they stayed for two years now off, off the dialysis, dialysis really? which is very good for them, which is fantastic. Well, you said something that was interesting that um, somebody may overdose on something lithium. And is so dialysis is used sometimes just to clean out somebody's system yes. if they've had some poison in their system yes. or something? Yeah. Okay. They're, um, Methanol poisoning, okay. moonshine. Okay. It's not as common here, but it's becoming popular out yeah. here, uh, yeah. like the back backyard uh, moonshining. Okay. Um, or suicide attempts with uh, ethylene glycol, which is antifreeze. Really? Or um, this is not as common here, but we have seen it in the in Brooklyn, Brookdale, right. in the inner city hospitals where there are more homeless people, and when they don't have enough money or they want a quick fix they don't have access to beer or anything else, they sometimes use antifreeze because okay. of a certain alcohol content. Okay. And those substances can be toxic to the body and kill the kidney okay. or damage a kidney significantly. It shouldn't be so dramatic. Yeah. Um, but that's also when we would use dialysis to eliminate those yeah. substances. Quickly and filter the blood. Yes, right. and that sometimes helps the kidneys to recuperate their function as well. Patient who's typically on dialysis, just describe the process. How often do they come in and, and what they actually go through? Just walk me through sort of a dialysis episode for a patient. Okay. So once the patient is on a regular schedule, the patient comes to the dialysis unit and um, waits. Then he goes into the main room where a nurse will take care of the patient and uh, take his blood pressure. And then the patient will sit in a chair. He will be connected to the machine either with the catheter or with the needles. Right. And then all he has to do is just patiently uh, sit in his chair. And okay. uh, one of my nurses, experienced nurses, says, and I heard her telling it and explaining it to the patients, the worst part about dialysis is really that it sometimes can get boring. Right. Because all you do is you sit there for three, three and a half to four hours, three times a week. Right. Um, and you have to kill time. Obviously, okay. we can watch TV, they can read, they can now with the uh, advanced technology, they have their smart tablets, yeah. smartphones. We have Wi-Fi access, they can listen to music, they read books, they play on their computers. Okay. So it helps to, to really make the time go by faster. And it's about three, three times a week? It is point? three times a week. Okay. Um, we have different shifts. Right. Um, we start at 6, 6.30 in the morning. Right. And um, it goes until, you know, the first shift then for four hours until 10, 10.30. Then there's a transition to the second shift. And the third shift then starts around 2.30, 3 o'clock. Okay. And we go until 5, 6 o'clock at night then. And if somebody's, essentially, are you recirculating their entire blood flow? Yes, pretty much. Yeah, and uh, so I guess there's fairly aggressive monitoring that's happening also just to make sure that everything's being done safely. Um, well, we repeat the blood and check for the clearance efficiency of the patient at least once a month. Okay. And um, then we evaluate the patient clinically if there are changes in how efficient the dialysis treatments could be. Okay. <coughs> patient on dialysis, can they still work? Yes, right. yes. And that's another thing actually I explained to the patient. Um, you have a part-time job. Three times a week you have to show up, you have to do your thing, meaning you have to get dia uh, dialyzed and then you're on your way back home. Okay. And a big concern for some patients is also exactly, I'm still at work and we try to accommodate our patients that if they prefer, they can work during the day and then at 2 o'clock, 2.30, they come three times a week to our dialysis units. If they are uh, working mainly uh, Monday through Friday, we try to give them a spot on Tuesday, Thursdays and Saturdays. They get the other dialysis treatment, but it won't affect their work as much. Okay. And sometimes the side effect of dialysis initially can be that you're more fatigued because okay. it is still a stressor to your body right. and um, it, some patients describe it as just being wiped out and again every patient is different and I had patients they you know I had their four treatments they came to the unit and they went right back to work the beauty of dialysis is also that it is really available all over the world right. 
And we, in the summer, particularly in the Hamptons, we have patients coming from, from Great Britain, from Germany, from, from the West Coast, from Florida. And if you have plans to visit as a dialysis patient, have plans to visit your family over um, Thanksgiving right. at the West Coast or in Florida, we make arrangements for you. We help you find a dialysis unit closest to the area where you plan to stay. So when you travel, you, you are safe and you can still be dialyzed and don't miss any of your treatments. And I know there was a time when there was a real shortage of dialysis machines, yes. but now it's, they're pretty pervasive, I think, yes. at this point. We're out of time, unfortunately, but I just, very quickly, I know the only um, real cure uh, or the way to get off dialysis is tra transplantation at this yes. point. And um, waiting lists, then quickly describe that. The waiting list on waiting time is different from state to state. Okay. In New York right now, it's anywhere from three to five years. Florida, it's two to three years. Okay. Um, that's a waiting list where you, wait, where you are waiting for a deceased donor kidney. Right. If you have friends or family, they can, if they are a match, they can donate the kidney to you. You can function with one kidney right. only fairly well. Now, if you have a family member who wants to donate your kidney but who is not a match, they now created, thanks to social media, a swap service. Okay. So if now the same situation is at the West Coast, there is uh, a, a donor but the uh, friend is not matching, they put both kidneys on the market. Okay. And the match in New York not, is matching the kidneys. Sale. Not for okay. sale. No, 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 right. not for sale. Right. That's correct. Right. Thank you. At least not in the States. Right. Um, there will be a swap between the kidneys from New York going to California and from California back to New York. I see. And a positive side effect of that is actually that you have very often an even better match right. than what you might get from a deceased person. Probably increasing number of donors because people number are thinking, of well, I don't match my sister or whatever, but that increases the chances someone else will be available for Yes. Me. Right. Yes, some some patients have uh, you know a resistance toward this, but uh, it's just the whole idea of swapping back and forth. Right. But uh, I know a few patients uh, who were originally with our dialysis unit, and they do excellent with right. this concept. Right. They did right. excellent. I know we talk about them as graduating from the dialysis. Yes, yes, it's yes. a wonder, uh, wonderful thing when that happens. Well. Unfortunately, Dr. Offer, we're out of time, and I really do appreciate your taking the time with us and also for the great work that you're doing at our dialysis center and in the nephrology program generally. We're very, very lucky to have you here. Well, so thank you for having me on board, and it's a pleasure being out here. glad you made it all the way from Germany to the east end of Long Island. <laughs> here. That's terrific. So am I, yes. That's great. Um, and I'd like to offer anyone who would like to make an appointment with Dr. Hofford for a consultation. He's a member of our Meeting House Lane Medical Practice and he sees patients in both Southampton and Hampton Bays, and I know we'll put the number up there for the Meeting House Lane practice, but it's 631-283-4048. I'd like to thank um, our friends at CTV for producing this show and airing it in Southampton. I'd like to thank all of our friends at LTV for airing the program in East Hampton communities. I'd like to thank all of you for tuning in and, and listening and contributing your ideas for how we can improve not only the program but our hospital. If anyone would like help navigating our healthcare system here on the East End or just needs help or advice, looking for advice, feel free to call my office at 631-726-8555. Thank you for watching and good health everyone.